Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, President of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And I'm Kirby Goodell, Professor of Political Science and Mass Communication at LSU. A big push by Governor Bobby Jindal since entering office has been the privatization of state government operations, which he says will save money. To accomplish this, the state has contracted with outside providers for, for professional, personal, and consulting services. Well, currently, Louisiana has nearly 13,000 active contracts, the majority for $50,000 or more. A proposed bill this legislative session would reduce spending on state contracts by 10 percent. But the Jindal administration says that the amount that Louisiana contracts for is already being reduced, and some of the biggest contracts are for essential services, such as the administration of health insurance or drug prescription programs. So how necessary are the majority of state contracts? Are they cost effective? And are there certain government services that should not be privatized? Tonight, Louisiana Public Square looks for answers on State Contracts 101. Soon after the nutritional services for the Southeast Louisiana Hospital in Jackson were privatized, State Representative Kenneth Havard began receiving complaints from patients' family members. The concerns were about the Pennsylvania Company providing meals for the hospital and a nursing home, both in Havard's district. They ran out of food 93 times. They bought hamburgers from McDonald's. Now these are all people, geriatric patients, who are taking medicine and it's very, very important for them to have the right nutritional value so that their medicines work. Havard says that the food provider company has not met performance indicators and is still being paid. They now receive oversight from state employees. And now we've got a bunch of state workers, and many, many of them, coming in early in the mornings to watch over and review what a private contractor was supposed to do to begin with. This session, Havard is sponsoring House Bill 128, the Privatization Review Act. The law would require a comprehensive review by the legislature and analysis by the Legislative Auditor's Office before the approval of state contracts worth more than $5 million. Havard has concerns with contracts such as the privatization of the state's charity hospital system, which was approved without legislative participation. I was elected and, and 105 other people in the, in the, or 104 other ones in the House was elected to be the people's lobbyists. We're responsible for their money at the end of the day and we should have a say in these contracts. Don Gregory is the former state Medicaid director and health care analyst for the Public Affairs Research Council or PAR. He co-authored a report for PAR about the privatization of the Louisiana Charity Hospital System. Among the issues that he raised was the sustainability of the funding stream. Well, we tried to follow the money in which they were investing in the new uh, partnership hospitals, and about half of that money is uh, federal money that comes from uncompensated care uh, for people that are uninsured. Uh, and we're concerned because the, uh, the Obamacare calls for an $18 billion reduction in that source of funding between now and the year 2020. Gregory says some of the private contracts do not have spending caps on them, which will leave the taxpayer on the hook for any overruns. Well, they budgeted $1.1 billion for those nine hospitals for this current uh, state physical year. Uh, if they exceed that in, uh, in cost, then the state will be obligated to, to make up those costs. Havard says that while it cost $100 million to run the Earl K. Long Hospital in Baton Rouge in 2012, costs have continued to climb since a private contract with Our Lady of the Lake was signed. The, the year after that, it was $138 million. This year, 14-15, we're projected at $169 million. That's a 68.9 percent increase. In February, the Legislative Fiscal Office said that there could be nearly a $14 million shortfall related to hospital retiree insurance benefit costs for which the state will be responsible. 
And earlier this month, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services told state officials it would not pay $307 million without further review of the state's financing plan. We don't need all these consulting contracts. And the remainder, we're not negotiating hard enough to get a good enough deal for taxpayers. For Louisiana Treasurer John Kennedy, it's not the state's privatization contracts, but the consulting ones that give him pause. We shouldn't use either the public or the private sector to hire somebody for $70,000 a year to go around Rapides Parish to encourage our Hispanic neighbors to wear their seatbelts. We've got a law. The Department of Health and Hospitals shouldn't be spending taxpayer money as they are to sponsor Golden Glove boxing tournaments. They say it's for obesity. We've already got programs for obesity. It's called PE. According to the Division of Administration, Louisiana is currently involved in nearly 13,000 active contracts, with more than half of them for $50,000 or greater. House Bill 142, sponsored this session by Representative D. Richard, would reduce spending on state contracts by 10 percent and devote the savings to higher ed. We spend about $6 billion every year in consulting contracts, state consulting contracts. This year, 10 percent is going to cut. It's telling you, if it passes, it's going to say you cut 10 percent of last year's dollar figure, which would be it's roughly $6 billion. Division of Administration Commissioner Christine Nichols testified against HB 142. This approach does not lend itself to good government. This is an arbitrary approach to, to, to putting in a plug that you don't know will have any value at all. Kennedy, who served on Louisiana's Streamlining Commission, which was the impetus for Richard's legislation, says the bill wouldn't be needed if Governor Jindal ran state government like a business. Just imagine what would happen if the governor wrote all 13,000, I think the figure is higher, of our consultants and said, you know, times are tough in Louisiana, we need money for higher education, we want you to reduce your contract this year by 10 percent or 5 percent or 3 percent, otherwise we're going to bid it out again. They're not going to say no. They're going to moan and groan, and they're going to do it. In this economy, they're going to walk away from a consulting contract because we've asked for a modest discount. While he has concerns with parts of both Representative Havard and Richard's legislation, PAR President Robert Travis Scott supports any efforts that make Louisiana's contracting process more transparent for its citizens. State contracting is a big part of public spending and it's a big part of taxpayer spending. So let's do it right, let's make it accountable, let's know what we're doing and why. Well joining me in our studio audience tonight to explore the state contracting process are residents from the Greater Baton Rouge area, including retired state employees, members of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council, and business owners. Welcome everyone. LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed over 150 citizens on tonight's topic. Here's a look at some of the responses. When asked about who they think provides services in a more timely and high quality manner, 48% of respondents said private employees hired by paid contractors, 30% said state government employees, and 22% were unsure. When asked if the charity hospitals in Louisiana should be run by the state or by private companies, residents were divided. 44% of those surveyed favored the state running them, 41% would prefer private companies running them, and 15% either refused or were unsure. Asked their opinion on current legislation that would reduce private contracts by 10%, 46% of respondents support the legislation, 31% oppose it, and 23% were unsure. And when asked if the state saves money, spends more money, or the costs remain about the same when the state contracts out state services to private companies, 40% of those surveyed think the state spends more money, while equal percentages, 24%, say either that the state saves money or that it costs about the same. 13% were unsure. So let's start there. Is contracting out state services a good idea or a bad idea? Who wants to start? I'll start it. I think it depends on the contract. I represent 140 consulting engineers, and a lot of our work is contracted with the state, either through the Department of Transportation, CPRA, Facility Planning. Those organizations aren't large enough to do the work that they hire our people to do. 
So it, de it depends specifically on the contract, but there's not a good or a bad here. It depends on the, on the particular service. Do other people agree with that? Trey. I'm kind of in the same boat because I'm a proponent of finding a good balance between contracts with private companies and then government organizations. Um, I think both can be beneficial when uh, per scenario. I think one of the issues you run into is whenever private companies can't reach the standards that government organizations can. A uh, quick scenario, my dad's the assistant district attorney here in Baton Rouge and he also works at a teen court and one of the issues he always finds when trying to find rehabilitation centers for troubled teens is that while one organization may help with a uh, kid who has drug abuse problems, they won't also help a kid who has uh, mental problems from like uh, domestic violence in the household. So they'll have to go and find like another private company, which just takes more time and money. I think if we are going to invest time and funds into these private organizations, they need to reach the same expectations and standards that government organizations would supply the people with. So you think government is, is providing a higher quality of service, at least in some of the, some cases and on some services? It's about balance. William? Yes, I, I think some of the areas, uh, <coughs> such as correctional and probational institutions, should not be run privately, simply because you're putting the person's uh, rights in jeopardy. I mean, they've been, uh, they're in the justice system, and they deserve uh, the state, and they deserve, uh, you know, the people's representatives uh, running that. Uh, and there have been some terrible cases in the South in general. Thank goodness uh, Louisiana hasn't yet jumped into that, but there have been some people thrown in jail and fined heavy exorbitant fines uh, for traffic tickets and ending up years in jail, and it's become an extortion racket. So I think there are certain areas, and that's one that gives me a real problem. Okay. So does anybody believe that uh, private industry can do a better job in terms of providing uh, uh, judicial or uh, judicial services? No one. I, I don't Patrick. Think, I don't think anybody uh, <laughs> thinks that they can do a hundred percent. I like to say I think everyone is is pretty split. Okay. You know, so, some things are better by private companies, okay. private companies, and some by the government. Okay. I don't think you're going to find anybody who is a hundred percent in either corner. Okay. John L. Yeah, I think something we should probably keep mindful as well is how does that affect the state's employees? I think having been a state employee before, mm -hmm. for a couple of years, I know exactly how. Um, being employed by R.K. Long before they kind of went defunct, mm -hmm. knowing how that kind of affects uh, patient care mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, but the employees as well. So I think when you're talking about the difference mm -hmm. in between private versus public, uh, you should always keep in mind how it affects those employees, of course. Okay, and, uh, and especially from your perspective, the public employees, correct? Of course, yeah. there's no doubt about that. Okay, yeah. John. Plus, too, one of the things that really hasn't been addressed adequately when you're talking about the private, private versus public debate is the fact that you have to have some kind of an oversight. In other words, just because you have an external party performing the services doesn't mean that they can be left alone. They have to have standards, expectations, and so forth built into their contract. Now, do you feel like uh, there are adequate protections to make sure that, that there's accountability in the system? Uh, John. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's adequate, uh, nearly enough oversight because that's, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a House bill on the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's important to, whether we continue the privatization or stick with, with, uh, with state, more state uh, jobs and, and contract from within, we need oversight for both of those. It's very important. Okay. Ty, you were. Well, I, I have some doubt about that. I think there's too much oversight. For example, if you have a, govern, uh, a governmental contract you're thinking about issuing, it is, of course, reviewed by whatever department it may be coming out of. It is then sent to civil service for further review, <laughs> sent to civil service for the further review because it may affect uh, those people who are employed in what I consider to be an already burgeoning uh, bureaucracy and the whole uh, purpose of privatization there would seem to me to be to reduce that bureaucracy because in many accounts it becomes, uh, or, or in many situations, it becomes unaccountable. Mm -hmm. Instead of being governed by those we select, we're being governed by nameless, faceless bureaucracies that have no real accountability themselves but are reviewing the private contracts to make sure that their nest doesn't get unfeathered 
and I have some issues with that. And, and so you're in worried the, both about accountability, but also the fact that we create, we're, we're trying to reduce bureaucracy, but we end up with such of a review process that we end up with more bureaucracy. Precisely. Right? And, and as far as the justice system goes, you've got to balance it there. You brought it up. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there are going to be policy decisions, which constitutionally, the, uh, the judiciary is part of that system. Uh, some of those services, for example, uh, drug testing, mm -hmm. that could be privatized without any problem at all. However, the policy part uh, becomes uh, a little bit more of a sticky wicket because you want to make sure that you have the, the right personnel, the right trained personnel, mm -hmm in order to uh, yeah. keep the prison population low. We have, yeah. as everybody knows, we already have more prisoners than any other state in the right. Union. Yeah. Michael Michael is well, ready to jump John in on this John point. That, that we <laughs> certainly need. Uh, one of my questions is, if we have the performance measures, who is establishing the performance measures? Mm -hmm. And perhaps more importantly, who is enforcing the performance measures, especially when we, mm -hmm. we just saw in the, the intro piece what has happened at, at Jackson and mm -hmm. the Southeast Louisiana Mental Hospital. Mm -hmm. Are we finding them uh, in, in that aspect? And, and I agree that we don't want to get into an aspect where we created so much bureaucracy mm -hmm. that we're actually costing ourselves money. But, yeah. Maybe that's what the panelists can help us with. <laughs> yeah, Austin, you're shaking your head. Do you agree? Uh, I agree on some aspects. I, I think that, um, you know, the issue is, is it's the waste. Um, you know, I believe that we should have some, some oversight, uh, especially um, by our state government. Um, but like what Ty said, you know, we don't want to create this bureaucracy where, it, you know, it takes so much time and the government becomes too large. But again, you know, the whole point of this was to reduce waste. And we're seeing an increase in that, like uh, he mentioned in Southeast uh, with the Jackson um, in the mental hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, you know, that's, that's deplorable that we're having to, you know, have food brought in from McDonald's. Yeah, so do people generally agree that there's more waste with a contracting system than with just having government do it in the first place? Mm -hmm. Daniel? You know, again, I think it, it, it de depends on the contract. I mean, you say there's 13,000 contracts out there today. Well, you only showed a handful of them that are problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you went through the 13,000 of them, how many are really problematic? And mm -hmm. it probably isn't that many. I mean, there are probably a lot of good contracts out there mm -hmm. that are, you know, working and working the way they should. But people like to point to the few bad apples and say, look, this is how the whole system is. And that isn't what the whole system is. It's a few, and, it, and go take care of those few. That's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to f further explore State Contracts 101. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing State Contracts, contracts 101. Joining us now is our panel of experts. John Kennedy is Louisiana's state treasurer, a position he has held since 2011. As treasurer, he oversees the state's $10.6 billion investment portfolios. Mr. Kennedy has been a vocal supporter of HB 142 this session, which calls for a 10% reduction of state contracts with the savings directed towards higher education. Ken Nakin is the CEO of the Louisiana Association of General Contractors, a statewide construction trade association representing over 600 building highway, heavy utility, and industrial construction firms. LAGC members work every day under state contracts. State Representative Kenneth Havard is a Republican who represents District 62. He currently sits on the House Commerce and Health and Welfare Committees. He is the sponsor of the Privatization Review Act, which would provide for legislative oversight and approval of contracts worth more than $5 million. Kevin Kane is the president of the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. The Institute's mission is to promote freedom and prosperity in Louisiana. While the Institute does not have a formal position on the privatization of government services, it does promote policies that limit the scope and cost of government. Before we go to our audience for questions, if each of you could tell me briefly, uh, from your own perspective, what your thoughts on our Louisiana state contracts and privatization. Treasurer Kennedy, we'll start with you. Well, we've got too many. We've got about 19,000, according to the Legislative Fiscal Office. 
We spend over $5 billion a year. We've cut higher education to the bone. Our bill would reduce the spending by 10 percent and dedicate the money to higher education. Um, these are the contracts for one department, consulting contracts for the Department of Education. Uh, 5,499 of them, 615 million taxpayer dollars, and these aren't the contracts. This is a listing of the contracts. Pick the first 50 names in the Baton Rouge phone book and ask them to eliminate 10 percent, and they'll have no problem. And you know what? The taxpayers will never notice the difference. But I tell you who will notice the difference, our universities that we've cut to the bone. What we've done to our universities at, uh, uh, to help consultants is uh, it, we ought to be embarrassed. Mr. Nakin, so you represent contractors, and is, is that the right perspective? We actually cannot operate without contracts, uh, Kirby. We, uh, we would, unlike, uh, unlike uh, uh, Treasurer Kennedy, we like to see more contracts. The people we represent that do work for the, uh, coastal restoration, facility planning, DOTD, uh, our contractors, the engineers that work for those agencies, they have to work on the contracts, and they're very well-defined. Uh, they have a tremendous, um, uh, the, all those departments have a contract review section. So we, we, we think we'd like to see more contracts, more work. But our problem is not road contracts. Ken's right about that. Our problem is not road contracts. <coughs> Representative Havard, you've introduced legislation also to deal with contracts. Right. Well, uh, the, the issue with my bill is not necessarily the state contract, especially the road contracts, maintenance contracts. Uh, contracts, you know, that we would do every day, you know, if we were going to buy paper supplies for a particular DHH. Mine deals mostly with privatization contracts, and it, I think that we need more oversight, a more con comprehensive review plan, which is right now we do not have that. And most citizens and probably uh, most people that aren't in state government probably don't realize that, that, you know, we're spending, you know, millions of dollars, and I mean $268 million, one contract, one uh, almost one billion dollars of the Office of Group Benefits and no, we, there's, the legislature did not have oversight into that contract and I'd want to put some, you know, a, a review process in place. That's what my bill does. Mr. Kane, from the Pelican Institute perspective, what's your... Sure, sure. Well, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, we, we are in favor of limiting the scope and the cost of government. <clears throat> so on the one hand, you know, I tend to uh, think if there's an opportunity to uh, have a service delivered at a higher level at a lower cost, uh, and if if you can do that uh, with a private company rather than you know, growing the size of government, then absolutely that's a good thing. Having said that, you do need oversight, uh, and so there has to be this balance. And there's no sort of you know privatization is good or it's bad. I mean, you have to have. I think there are certain areas of government which probably can't be privatized. I mean, I don't see how you could, for example, privatize the police department. Uh, I just don't think that that's realistic or, or would really lead to better outcomes. But I think there are a lot of other things that can be. But again, having said that, uh, there needs to be appropriate oversight or it's a disaster. Yeah. Well, let's go to our audience. Trey, you had a question. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think it's a either or, kind of like what you were saying just now. But I do feel like there has to be a way, if we are going to go towards the private route, which, you know, like I said, there have to be some things that it would make more sense to go private. But then there's also things where it make more sense to go governmental how would you oversee private organizations? Because that's just somebody saying, you know, it's my business, and who are you to tell me how I should run my business as long as I'm following the law? How would you oversee it? That's my question. Sure. Well, I, I know that some of, I know that uh, Treasurer Kennedy and, and uh, Representative Havard can probably know more about that than me, but I just say as a general thing, it's absolutely doable. I mean, for one thing, you just build it into a contract. Uh, and that's one of the advantages of privatization is that it's actually easier, I think, to get rid of a bad private, uh, you know, company uh, than it is a, a part of government that you've sort of grown and hired people. Uh, it's probably easier to get rid mm -hmm. of the bad eggs, but as to how to do that, I think and they're... You, well, you've got to make a distinction between privatization and frivolous contracts. Privatization you, is, is a, a, a calculus. You ask yourself, what are the vital services and products that government should deliver to taxpayers? Once you have that list, you ask, who can do a better job and a cheaper job, but equally efficient, of delivering those products or services? If it's the private sector, you go with the private sector. If it's the public sector, you go with the public sector. That's wholly separate from the issue of, of frivolous contracts that neither the private nor the public sector can do. 
And the contracts I'm talking about, I'll give you a couple. We talk about this in the abstract. Let's get down in the weeds. Contract number 672113. This is where your tax dollars went. Contracted to provide program that will assist students to learn valuable social skills through organized play on their recess and lunch periods. We hired a California consultant. <coughs> now, my son had lunch and recess down immediately in pre-K. He, he, you know, he's 18 year, years old now. He's still good at it. It triggers a different story. Uh, here's another one, contract number 708691. Quote, inform and educate the Hispanic community in Rapids and Natchitoches parishes of seatbelt usage. Contract number 681869, state sponsorship of chimpanzee discovery days involving broad media attention to observation of chimpanzees in a spacious forestry habitat. I could keep going the rest of the hour. These are the contracts that our bill would eliminate. It would generate about $528 million every year, and we'll spend that money on education, on LSU, on Southern, on Delgado. We have cut them 67 percent. You don't believe me? Ask Kirby what's happened to our universities in the last five years. Yeah. But, but now, part of your concern is frivolous lawsuits, but the other question is accountability um, in terms of, and mm -hmm. so th there are two issues here. Uh -huh. At least one of them is, are we paying for things that we shouldn't? And another one is, are we getting out of the contracts what we actually need to get? Representative mm -hmm. Havard, yeah. would you comment on that? Right. We, we need to set up a comprehensive review plan up front. What do we expect the contractor to do, and how do we expect him to get there? And then at, and have those performance indicators built into the contract. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, we need to review those contracts and make sure that that's you know that we're where we're getting what we paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at you know the um, the legislature is responsible for the budget. So at the end of the day, you know if if we've got three guys in the back room, you know working on a contract and I'm not responsible for it, which I got I mean or I am responsible for it, but. Uh, but I have no insight into it or input into it, then what good am I to even be there? You know, I'm there, uh, you know, these people have tons and tons of lobbyists, you know, these uh, contractors, whether it's Blue Cross or Blue Shield or whomever the con is, is bidding on the contract. Mm -hmm. We, you know, as a legislature, I'm the people's lobbyist. That's why I'm there, to make sure their money is spent well, so we should have a say or at least a look at these contracts. Mr. Nuckin, is d taking contracts, do you feel like the review process is adequate? How, does, how do you go through the review process? How do we know your <clears throat> the contracts are doing what they're supposed to do? Well, the three agencies I, I mentioned that we work for uh, and, and that, that uh, Mr. Mobley's group works for, the uh, consulting engineers and architects uh, around the state, uh, they have a closeout session at the end of each project. Uh, how many plan changes were on a project? How many change orders? Were there any plan errors, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And those architects or engineers that work for the state, that goes into their next uh, presentation on how they got graded out coming out of those contracts. Mm -hmm. And they have to make a presentation. They have to not bid, go to the lowest bid, but they have to make a proposal, an RFP, to those three state agencies to be hired again. Um, and they they have great closeout sessions on on those, and there's no reason why, if they can't do it for these, why any other agency can't do it for the other contracts. So, so now, what about the across the board cut idea and the 10 percent across the board? Would it how how would that affect you and your contract? Well, road contracts aren't consulting contracts. Okay, they're building contracts. Right. Okay. And that has nothing to do with this bill. Right. Can and we make bill, sure of that, John? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I mean, I'll do an amendment. <coughs> but but sure. this bill doesn't affect but Medicaid providers, and it doesn't affect yeah. build, the capital outlay or any of our building contracts. Okay. See, my bill has nothing to do with maintenance contracts, engineering contracts, road contracts. It's strictly to do with privatization contracts, like the Earl K. Long Hospital mm -hmm. is a perfect example. We, you know, it, when we started that contract, it was $100 million. Th you know, that was two years ago. This year, it's $169 million. So is it saving us money? I don't think so. I mean, if we look at it in those terms. And there's other contracts that are out there that we need to spend time, you know, up front, I think, looking at. CNSI was a perfect example of a contract that we had, and we in ended up pulling that contract and losing millions of dollars that we had invested in it if we would have done our due diligence up front. And that's all I'm asking. Yeah. Did you explain deal. the CNSI situation just very briefly? Well, we hired we hired a contract to do. The, I think it was the Medicaid billing. Is that right, John? Mm -hmm. And and it was a firm that came out of uh, Michigan, and they I think it was Michigan. And we anyway, uh, our due diligence wasn't done up front. We, later we found out that there may have been some improprieties between the uh, Department of Health and Hospitals and who. Uh, 
the former DHH secretary worked for and all these things. Had we gone into those contracts and actually looked at them, we probably would have caught some of this stuff up front. Michael, you've been waiting to get in. Well, the first thing I've got to ask Mr. Kennedy is how do I get one of those contracts? Well, we've got 19,000 of them. <laughs> Can you speak Spanish? <laughs> Mostly you have to know a politician. <laughs> I'm out of luck there. I think most of us have agreed, and what I mentioned earlier was that uh, we've got to have some performance measures. And uh, who takes care of, of the penalties if they don't meet up? with the performance measures. I'm just intrigued of why OLOL has gone up. Didn't we set what we were going to pay them? We, we did. We, we absolutely did. But what's happened is our Medicaid reimbursement rates have been cut from the feds, so that you know cost us our share. Also, these contracts were signed, and many of you have talked about being business guys or, or, or ladies. and you would not have signed a contract that had 50 blank pages. Some of these contracts had 50 blank pages before we signed them. And it's coming back to haunt us now because Medica the federal government has now said in the last week, we don't agree with the way you set this leasing you know, payment up or this contract, so we're going to not pay you $307 million. We're going to hold those funds from you next year. So that's already a $307 million hole in the budget because we didn't do our work up front. John Cuvelin, you can... One of the questions I have, and this is getting into the hypothetical for the elected officials, we're kind of in a brave new world, so to speak, with regards to privatization, you know, group benefits, the charity hospital system, and so on and so forth. The part of the discussion I haven't heard, and this is getting into the hypothetical, is after several years of these contracts running, if, let's pretend, these contracts are not determined to provide cost savings and benefits to the state, would it be contemplated that those services might perhaps be insourced again? Well, the, the, yes, but if it's a huge contract, let's take the privatization of our hospital system, which I support, support it and still support. Um, but once you turn over all of your health care to these select private hospitals, you can't just take them back on a dime. That's part of the problem. I supported the privatization because we, we were told that it would save money and it wouldn't sacrifice quality of care. The administration's original estimate was that we would only have to spend $600 million on the privatization of our hospital's contracts. I said that's a great deal because we're spending $900 million now. The problem is that that $600 million became $1.2 billion and it's going up again next year. And I support the privatization but I, I have yet to see the savings. And we just heard from the federal government that they're going to withhold about $307 million of our Medicaid money, which is very troublesome. Um, so the jury's still out on it. I support the concept. It can work, but it's supposed to save money, and I haven't seen the numbers yet. There, there's, a, there's other issues that, that we don't take into effect, too, when we close Earl K. Long then there's $50 million that we had to give the Department of Corrections because there was nowhere for them to bring, you know, the inmates. So that's going to private, you know, and those numbers are not in, in that the operating cost of Earl K. Long or Our Lady of the Lake now. Also, you have, you, 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 don't, you need to look at the private hospitals that surround Earl K. Long. You've got Lane and, and uh, Zachary who didn't, you know, they didn't have the luxury of cutting a deal to get the full reimbursement from the state. So every time an indigent patient walks into that uh, 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 hospital, not the hospital, mm -hmm. but into the emergency room, they get zero reimbursement for it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes with uh, the general. So we're, we've swamped the uh, hospitals in the surrounding areas in that radius that was closed in the lake reaping all the benefits, but are we getting the services? Because I can tell you this, if you try to go there now, many, many times, you know, we just saw the other day on the, uh, on the news where the emergency room rates have, you know, waiting times have gone up. And, and now what happens if we cut those contracts by 10 percent? Are those, are those not, part of what you're included? No, they they're they're be, not included because they're of They're not included. No. The no. contracts, and that's why I say, Kirby, it's important to sure. distinguish between privatization and right. frivolous contracts. The, the kind of contract I'm talking about, here's another one. Contract number 725404. Ballroom dance teaching life <laughs> skills and family values to fifth graders. <laughs> now we need to be teaching them math right. and and right. and reading. And and here's another one. Here's a five hundred and forty-seven thousand seven hundred ninety dollar contract. 
Contract 660531. Quote, teach participants the skills needed to live a more self-sufficient lifestyle through gainful employment. I think we all know that we're better off with a job than without. <laughs> so, but, but if I'm the ballroom teacher and you cut my contract by 10%, do we have a problem then? Tim? Well, I would cut I mean, it completely. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I've already got the contract. No, so. uh, we have a provision in every contract, every consulting contract, that says that the state can get out of it by sending them a, a, a letter and giving them 30 days' notice. Okay. So why don't we do it? Why don't we? Yeah, why? Because a lot, of the, the, a lot of these contractors are politically connected. Yeah. I'll be blunt. Let, let, me, let me get a question from Haley. She's been waiting to get in. So you mentioned all these frivolous contracts. Uh -huh. Why has nobody objected to them before they were signed? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. There's a there's a group called Office of Contractual Review. There's six people in it. Um, it's in the the uh, the Division of Administration, which is under the governor's office, and they're supposed to review all these contracts. Um, but uh, they don't people? review them for policy. They just review them for form. Well, the, you know, the Louisiana the governor. governor it was the way it's set up. He's a very powerful man. It was set up that way here, in, you know, in the Constitution uh, Convention years ago. So, you know, you have very few people that are actually looking at the contracts, especially the privatization contracts. You have, you know, the LSU Board of Supervisors was the ones who reviewed the contracts for, you know, Our Lady of the Lake. They're not elected. They're appointed positions. You know, they've been put on that board, so they don't have to answer to anybody except who appointed them. You know, I have to answer to my constituents, and that's where the rub is with me. You know, if I'm responsible for it, then I want to see the contract and at least have some input. Cindy, you had a question? Yes. Um, I think most of us agree that, like Trey said, a balance is what's needed. Mm -hmm. Contracts aren't bad or good. It's just a balance. But I think the problem lies in maybe in the review board. How do some of these contracts even get passed? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Well, it's not the legislature's fault. They never see these. Mm -hmm. They fly under the radar. Uh, we should have a, 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 a group that says, look, you know, why, why are you hiring somebody, give them, paying them 60000 a year to right. tell somebody to wear their seat belts exactly. when it's the law? But there are thousands of these. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are thousands of these things. And the money, I would eliminate every one and dedicate the money to education. So it, is it possible to start eliminating, or is it just sure. grown all, out all of the, control go the governor can do it uh, with an executive order, um, but we have a bill. That it's not an across-the-board cut. It would direct every agency of state government mm -hmm. to reduce its spending on consultants by a very modest 10 percent by eliminating contracts or asking for discounts. They can keep spending 90 percent. But that will, if we've got so many contracts, that will generate $528 million a year. It doesn't touch the road contracts. It doesn't touch Medicaid providers. And we're going to dedicate that money to LSU and Southern and, and Tech and ULL and our other universities. So if it's political, though, how does it happen? <laughs> well, look, we, we've got enough money, Kirby. $25 billion budget, $19 billion when Governor Blanco was governor, $12 billion when Governor Foster was governor. We've got enough money to be number one in the South in education, our coastal restoration, our road construction, but we don't have enough money to be number one in the South in those things and number one in the South in political patronage. So we've got a choice to make. Okay. What's the, 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 what's the Pelican well, Institute? Uh, well, look, I mean, who can argue that, you know, who can argue in favor of wasteful contracts? And I, I'm, I'm not, and I, again, I haven't looked at the contracts in question. I'm, I'm generally, you know, very much opposed to a lot of the sorts of programs uh, and some of the NGOs that are out there. The Treasurer Kennedy's been very good at sort of uh, uh, watchdogging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think some of that's just inherent with a government that spends that much money and is involved in so many different things. I think one of the, you know, one of the reasons I'm sort of philosophically inclined to support the general concept of privatization while of course acknowledging it has to be done right is that um, is that I do think it's easier to build accountability into it and then it's easier to get rid of the people who aren't performing and I think what's you know what's interesting is uh, uh, gentlemen earlier mentioned <coughs> the issue of um, private prisons and uh, and uh, you know in Louisiana we have the highest incarceration rate in the country 
And yet private prisons are very small players here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we have is a system where about half of the state prisoners are uh, incarcerated in local prisons around the state. And, uh, and then we pay the sheriffs uh, per diem money from the state uh, mm -hmm. for the number of prisoners they hold. So ba basically we've incentivized them to incarcerate as many people as possible. Now I'm not attacking the sheriffs here. They're doing what they were asked to do. If they weren't doing that, we would have to build more prisons, which is also very expensive. Right. But we have created an, an incentive that I think most of us would agree is very problematic in that you know, now many of them, their budget, a big part of their budget is dependent on having a certain number of people incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, now this has happened without private prisons playing a role here. And so people generally think, well, this, these sorts of problems are created by the private sector. I mean, in fact, maybe the private sector could help get us out of that somehow. Um, you know, maybe, and I'm just speaking hypothetically here, if you had companies that were incentivized to uh, educate and give job training to mm -hmm. people who were in jail, who we know were going to be getting out and preparing them for life on the outside, and if they were incentivized to bring down recidivism rates, mm -hmm. or that sort of thing, or maybe we can just find ways to do that with the sheriffs. Sure. But it's really about mm -hmm. what do we want to accomplish, what sort of incentives do we put in place to get there, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, as I said, in some cases the private sector will do it better, in some cases I think we have to have it within the public sector, but that's, you know, that's really what matters. Okay. And is there a way to take the politics out of the review process? <laughs> Can we, can we get well, to a non-political, objective, I, fair review process? I, I mean, my opinion, I don't think you'll ever take politics completely out of anything because we're human beings and it's just, you know, the way we are. I mean, we want to try to, you know, we, we want good people in there and I think we've got a lot of good people in the Capitol and, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it'll never be perfect, but, uh, you know, that's why we have these sorts of discussions. Well, what my bill would do would, would, would at least get the legislative auditor in on the front end to look at the contracts up front, certify those numbers, let us know that it's, it's actually saving us money or it has the potential to save us money, and then certify the numbers, send it to the House uh, Oversight Committee that has jurisdiction over that particular um, uh, subject matter, and then let us make a decision from there. That's what, it, that's what this process would do. That's what my bill would do. Just I'm having trouble getting support out of the administration <laughs> because no, you know they want to run the business the way you know we've always run it in Louisiana, and that's not we we can't afford it now. But now when you when you have a contract going through, what's the review process? I know we're talking roads versus frivolous, and and there's some distinctions that we're making here. But do you feel like the review is is too limited? Too thir what, what's the, what's the review process? From our standpoint, Kirby, I think it's very. Uh, I mean, it's within the departments. It doesn't go to the office right. of contract. Sure. Con contract review. It's within the individual uh, departments, and I think they do a very good job of of, of closeout and performance measures, uh, et cetera. Um, I think what uh, Treasurer Kennedy said is there really is no review process today. The office of contract review is six people, and he's correct. All they do is look at the legality of the contract. Mm -hmm. They don't sit there and look at, well, do we need this contract? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the audience, elected, some elected officials, and really people in Louisiana are looking for is, is do we need these contracts? I mean, and if, and if it's an out-of-state company that gets the contract, what is the tax implications versus an in-state company that gets All of those things need to play into it, or are we getting our bang for our buck? Austin, you've been waiting to get in. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question. Yeah, it just it really surprises me that you're not getting support from the administration because at the beginning of his first term, we saw a big push for fiscal reform in the state, and you know I saw that your bill, you know, barely even made it through a Senate committee. I mean, it got a, it was a tie of a four-four, and my whole thing is Republicans run on being fiscally conservative. You know, why aren't you getting support for this bill? Well, why is that? Th my particular bill was is, this bill is the same bill I carried last year. Last year, I, I, they sent it to two committees, and I got it out of both committees without an objection uh, on, a, on the House side. Got it off the House floor with 93 votes, not a no vote. I had a, about a three-minute hearing in uh, Senate committee, and they killed it. So this is the same bill that I'm bringing this year. I'm going to go through the same process, and I can tell you this. I don't care who the governor is. I'm going to bring it every year as long as I'm there until I get it passed. Ty, you had a question. Well, I was just curious to see if you all agreed or disagreed that it sounds like part of the problem with the issuance of the contracts, with the way the contracts are administered, the way they are then reviewed because the elected officials are ultimately going to have the responsibility for this, right? It sounds to me like, well, let me put it this way. I want to know, do you all agree that perhaps the bureaucracy itself that we've created 
as just simply operating out there as its own planet and unaccountable to anyone for the decisions it makes about recess and chimpanzees and whatever uh, Treasurer Kennedy brought up. I, I don't think the, the, the road contracts are different. There's a whole separate yeah, apparatus, that. but but uh, I don't think these contracts are being reviewed for policy. I mean, we've we've cut higher education from our general fund by 67 percent since 2008. Yeah, yeah, now, in light of that, why would anybody approve contract number 686276? Quote one day seminar leadership Disney style from the leader for the leadership academy at DCRT. <laughs> you know why would anybody approve uh, DHH? We know is short of money. They just signed a contract to spend twenty thousand dollars to spend, sponsor two Golden Glove boxing well, tournaments. That's my question. If we turn this over to the bureaucrats who just simply operate in their own sphere and are unaccountable, these aren't decisions are made by bureaucrats. These decisions come from higher up. Right. Okay, Chris, you. I was wondering, Representative Hubbard, uh, like he was saying, that's that's this, these are ridiculous. He's talking about, but also, how does a hundred million dollar? I think I'm quoting the correct amount. A hundred million dollar contract become a hundred million dollar contract. I think it was group benefits or group insurance, without your eyes seeing it. Who checks the checker? I guess is my question. Because the process we have now is based, it was set up because we wasn't set up for privatization of state functions. We were set up for building roads and doing the engineering work and doing those types of contracts. Now we have no, uh, no review process, and that's what this bill would do. So the so privatization I'm, has just been in the last couple administrations, or? right? Okay. But just so I'm just so I'm clear, so your all's concern is, as I hear it, is mostly review on the front end, making sure that we're not spending money on things we don't need, as opposed to review on the back end to make sure that performance indicators are both. met. And on the, on that case, it sounds like maybe there isn't as big of a problem, or am I reading far too much into this? <coughs> well, over, I'll just say this: over the last few years since I've been there. You know, I've heard the gold standard of ethics and, and transparency and all of these things. You know, it's time that we match our uh, actions to our rhetoric. That's all I'm asking, and that's what we need to do, on, on, especially on a privatization contract. I'm not as familiar with, you know, the road and bridge contracts and, and maintenance contract, engineering and so forth, but those, you know, you're talking a $50,000 contract versus a $1 billion contract. You know, we need oversight, but it's and we need transparency. It's a question of priorities, Kirby. Mm -hmm. The Department of Children and Family Services spent a hundred million dollars establishing a website. Mm -hmm. The contractor, Deloitte, from out of state, they're out of, uh, I think they're out of Pennsylvania, they're all over the world, mm -hmm. um, didn't finish the job. Mm -hmm. They got a new contract. Mm -hmm. You know what their penalty was for not finishing the job? <coughs> Nothing. That would never happen in the private sector. Now, I don't think we should have spent $100 million on a website. I think that $100 million should have spent in our universities. Mm -hmm. but, but even if you disagree with me, if the contractor doesn't perform and screws up the website, shouldn't there be a penalty? And, and, and are there inadequate penalties then? So that, yeah. that's the problem. Well, it, it, to, uh, before you mentioned this uh, issue of you know, front end versus back end, and actually, I mean, back end is may maybe a different issue but hugely important, and to kind of give you an example of that, I mean, I'm on the board of an organization in New Orleans that runs three charter schools. Mm -hmm. And I think actually an example of, of this sort of thing being done properly is that you know, char organizations that are given charters to run schools are reviewed you know, by the state, and after a certain period of time, if they are not meeting you know, set performance measurements, uh, they lose the charter. And so we're seeing schools in New Orleans, organizations that are failing to perform in, in their, you know, managing schools, they lose the charter. And that's, to, to me, that's how, um, if you're going to, I mean, this is a form of privatization, I suppose, in that you're taking schools out of, uh, out of government control and they're being run by different uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, so I think that's a good example of how that can work properly. Uh, well, I'm glad he brought that up about the charter schools because a lot of these charter schools and a lot of people don't know this and realize that a lot of them are for-profit charter schools. So they're being operated by for-profit companies through the veil of a non-profit 
organization. So we're given money you, in order to operate. A, it's in the current law. In order to operate a charter school in Louisiana, you have to be a nonprofit. But I can set up a nonprofit, set up a board. The state gives me MFP dollars, which are tax dollars that everybody pays for, you know, or, or sends your money, whether it's local tax dollars or state tax dollars, to a, a, a nonprofit. I then turn around and give it to a for profit company who makes money, you know, and, and, and is making a for profit. Those, you know, now, and there are some checks and balances in that to make sure that they are doing properly and operating properly. But if they're taking taxpayer dollars, and they're buying a building or a computer or a pencil, then that property should stay with the state or the local school board or the or the the NGO or the organization that actually got the charter. Well, let, let me just uh, kind of raise sure. a question based on that. And, and I, if if somebody is improperly doing that, kind of creating a uh, you know a, a nonprofit to sort of cover for a for profit, and that's against the law. That's one thing. But I mean, I just raised this question. I think we ought to consider is. Let's say a for-profit company does a better job of educating our children. Mm -hmm. Does anybody really have a problem if they turn a profit in doing that? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't our goal actually to educate children? I don't. Uh, I don't really have a problem if somebody turns I, a profit I, I, in I'd, doing I'd, it. I'd hire, hire some more of them if they, if they can work, right. if they work. <coughs> John L. has a question. And of course, and this is for either one of your panel members, I guess. I think that the, maybe the kind of elephant in the room a little bit is we kind of keep traversing back toward education. And my question for either one of you would be, how do you think the move potentially to privatization would affect um, education specifically, I guess, in some ways? I, let me talk elementary and secondary education first. I will support anything. I don't care what the political cost. I'll support anything that improves our public schools. No. Anything. In terms of higher education, our problem in higher education is money. Their budget has been cut 67 percent. I mean, Southern, LSU, other the universities, they have the tools right now. They just don't have the funding. So it's a, it's a separate problem. It is. Okay. William, you had a question. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the big issue here is conflict of interest, and I have no problem with a school doing better, a private school, although who's checking? You know, who's accounting for it? Does the public get to see what they're teaching? If a private company owns a school and also has oil interests or something, they may not want to teach environmental science. So conflict of interest is, is my biggest stumbling block. But I'm also wondering, are we creating a, a, a too big to fail, if, like in the health care, for instance, uh, what kind of legal recourse is the state going to have if there's a problem down the road? I mean, are, uh, do you have provisions, are there provisions to avoid lengthy litigation that a Big, you know, healthcare company could amass huge war chests to tie up the state and, over, you know, hold us over a barrel. Yeah. Um, CNSI is a good example because, right, they've sued over the. We're over in the middle of a lawsuit now, you know, with CNSI. <laughs> you know, and and we could have prevented that lawsuit possibly by doing our due diligence on the front end. Well, we're also in the middle of a grand jury investigation, more importantly. Yes. Correct. Yes. So. yes. Daniel, you've been waiting to get in. I have. Um, Representative, 19,000 contracts. How does 135, 40 of you all get your, try to get your hands around that? I mean, you, you'd have to do what Washington does and you'd have to become a full time legislator. No, you wouldn't. No. No, well, my bill is anything over $5 million, you know, as far as a privatization contract. I'm not wanting to dig into every single contract as far as a road contract or an engineering contract you know that's a whole separate issue that I mm -hmm. think uh, uh, Representative Richard and uh, Treasurer Kennedy is talking about mine is we're not talking about a whole bunch of privatization contracts but we are talking about significant contracts 268 million dollars here you know 300 million dollars there a hundred here one billion dollars we should be looking at those contracts here's what you do Dan it's real simple we have a joint legislative committee on the budget, House Appropriations, Senate Finance. They re re meet once a month. Before they have a meeting, they get a list of all of the contracts that have been signed the previous month. If nobody has any questions, the contract's approved. But if somebody has a question, you hold a hearing on it. Now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. The people behind the Chimpanzee Discovery Days contract, 
they're not going to uh, try to get that contract anymore because they know that the committee is going to call them to a hearing and the press is going to be there and taxpayers are going to be w watching. And so they're not going to even try it anymore. And a lot of these frivolous contracts will just go away. Uh, sunlight's a pretty good antiseptic. But you get a new frivolous contract that looks at... But it doesn't become final until, until it's approved by the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget. But how did these get approved then, John? Because there is no law requiring that they be approved by the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget right uh -huh. now. So does somebody have a bill in to do that? You will see legislation to do that. But what I would like to do first before we do that is to reduce the spending by 10 percent. It's not across the board. We tell every agency head, reduce your spending by 10 percent on consultants. Now, some of our agency heads make $400,000 a year. So we're asking them to use their management skills, and then we're going to take that money and we're going to spend it uh, in, in our uh, university communities. Well, we've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Nakan, Representative Havard, and Mr. Kane for their insight on this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, a lively conversation, and I think if the viewers want to know more information, uh, they can go to the D Division of Administration website, and also one of our guests has a website, sunshine.org, right? Yeah, and, and always a great conversation, and always learn a lot from our guests and from our, uh, from our panelists. Although um, Secretary Kennedy says it'll take you three years to see all <laughs> of the contracts, and they change every day, so that means a, a lot of reading. Well, that's all the time we have, though, for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey, view extended interview clips, and comment on tonight's show. We'd love to hear from you like we did last month following Louisiana and the minimum wage. Dorian writes to us, minimum wage increments should be increased annually until it reaches a national level. Charlene writes, this is very simple. Raise minimum wage so people can pay their bills and have enough money left to do things with their families. And Pete writes to us, these jobs were created as part-time jobs. They were never intended for full-time family-supported jobs. Well, thanks to everyone for their comments. The month of May means, means the end of the school semester and the entry of thousands of new college graduate, graduates into Louisiana's job market. This year, these job seekers will also be joined by hundreds of returning veterans as the military downsizes its troops overseas. So what does Louisiana's employment market look like for these job hunters? Join us next month as Louisiana Public Square looks for answers on Job Market 2014. Thanks for watching and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.